sometimes we are enticed and trapped within images and images become still enclosures. And the only way we can see ourselves doing other things is if something breaks down that image. I'm Ron Jor, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Dr. Bayo Okomolafe is an academic lecturer, a spiritual leader, a disillusioned activist, and the author of These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, Letters to My Daughter About Humanity's Search for Home. He was born in 1983 into a Christian home and to Yoruba parents in Western Nigeria. Soon after he was born, his family emigrated to Bonn, Germany, with his father on his first diplomatic assignment. This, Bayo's first trip, would foreshadow a life of travel, both literally and figuratively. He currently lectures at Pacifica Graduate Institute, California, and University of Vermont. He's also professor of practice at Middlebury College. He sits on the board of many organizations, including Science and Non-Duality, Unashai Sanctuary, and more. Now living between India and the United States, Bayo is a proud father and a devoted husband. I talked to Bayo at the end of January, and it was right after a design sprint with Rabbi Amichai Laulavi, who's a former guest of the podcast, where Bayo's work and his online course actually was one of the demos that we looked at as an example. I'm very excited to bring you this conversation with Bayo, and I was very excited to talk to him. His writing is intensely beautiful. He speaks and seems to think in poetry. His words paint pictures that move us, but avoid being captured. I think Bayo is an awakened person. He clearly sees things in a way that's deeper and that's hard to comprehend sometimes. But his efforts at clarity and communication are very obvious and, and evident here. And I think, I think it will be appreciated. I'm a little bit worried that people who don't really have any strong spiritual background might find some of these topics hard to understand or relate to. So I want to leave you with this recommendation. I, I would like you to imagine the world as a dynamic, elaborate, interdependent, ever-changing and shifting, and intensely alive cloud of interactions, where nothing is quite as solid or as clear-cut as it seems to be. Now, imagine seeing this mess so clearly you can feel it in your being, and then having to find the words to describe it, knowing full well that every word and sentence leaves out as much as it brings in. And so, as you listen to Bio's words, I would like you to try to understand that he's trying to communicate something that's intensely non-verbal. That's, at least that's how I connect with it and how I find my way into it. And so, what did we talk about? So, we talked about him growing up in transition, Nigeria to Germany, and then many other places. We talk about family being a constant value in his life. We talk about his love-hate relationship with India. We talk about his activism and his post-activism. And what does it mean to be a post-activist or to be post-activistic? And specifically, I think, what it means to discover as an activist that your very activism has become part of the problem you're trying to solve. And what does it mean to engage with the world without trying to apply your prejudices on it? And we talk about hope and why it too can be problematic. And I'll let Bio's words describe that because he can speak to it so much better than I can. 
and and finally we talk about how he sees the world and and this i think goes to the core of a lot of his writings and a lot of his teaching and how he tries to stay to not get trapped by images and words to experience a world that's alive and not static and dead and to to avoid overly defining things and overly restricting our view of the world through that definition overall i think this was one of the most interesting and also challenging conversation i've had but i hope that you'll see that there is a lot of value here this is one of a dozen or so weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers designers makers authors entrepreneurs and activists who are working to change our world for the better so please follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe whenever we mention something whether it's a book article product or other resource we always include it in the show notes so make sure to check those as well and now let's jump right in with dr bio akomolafe i'm sitting here across the screen with dr bio akomolafe bio welcome to the show it's my great pleasure to be with you brother thank you for inviting me I would like to start with our kind of traditional at this point covid check-in and so I'd love to hear how covid affected you personally I know you li- you live in India how yeah. it affected your work you know, you define yourself as a trans public intellectual how does covid affect that work and I'll add on top of it what surprised you about this covid experience <sighs> Well, let me speak to you this way. The easiest, or the, actually the more difficult thing to speak about is how it affected our family life. It was really difficult for, mm. of course, countless families across the world. But for our family, it was difficult. We all caught the bug and mm. it, was, it was very hard navigating touch and communication and communication. staying with our kids and navigating vulnerability and not mm-hmm. having to see each other and enacting isolation. And it had mm-hmm. other secondary complications in terms of what the virus did to the members of our family at both ends, both extreme ends. My mother-in-law, who is the matriarch, oldest person in the family, down to my four-year-old son. So it did leave its mark on us. But there is another sense in which it affected and changed everything. And that's the way events, cracks, fault lines, discontinuities break through the usual, the familiar, and insert something unspeakable. When the pandemic was announced, there was a... There was a Actually, it wasn't a subtle form of excitement. I, I felt some kind of apocalyptic aesthetic was being mm. born, that we were living in unusual times. And I felt excited that mm. finally the drab normal can be halted. Of course, it's never without consequences, but I felt finally the aliens have arrived, finally. Mm. The apocalyptic roar of the invisible has disrupted the soundscape, the soundtrack of the obvious. And now we have to do something different. We have to think different. We have to meet each other differently. This consumerist humdrum can be halted in its tracks. Of course, it's never as theoretically simple or as experientially convenient as As our poetry or as our writings make it out to be, but mm. this whole time has just been a way for me personally to come to terms with a world that is not amenable to our devices that it's a world that escapes design mm. it's a world that will not be put in a family way. 
or that is too promiscuous to settle, to converge. And that mm. is delusion, that is theoretically potent, that is decolonial, that is fugitive, that is powerful. I'm leaning mm. into these times and I found some kind of a voice, a gift to speak with and to speak to this time. It's the reason I call myself a trans-public intellectual. Not just a public mm. intellectual, but a trans-public intellectual, meaning I situate myself at the edges of the known and mm. gesture towards the unknown and the uncertain. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I spoke to Christian Matspia, who's a researcher. He wrote a book, Sense Making, And his take on COVID was, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study any number of things about humans and society yeah. because there are many things that you really can't really measure their impact until they're taken away. So I'd love to hear what you feel you learned or what surprised you in this whole process. Well, I would put it as something I've learned. I would put it as a different posture. There's a positional difference that is emerging, right? It's not, oh, this is a lesson. I'm done with that. There's nothing particularly categorical about the ongoingness of this. And mm -hmm. I often shy away. I'm quite hesitant to name easy lessons. I love what that brother said about this is an opportunity, right? There is a sense in which, yes, until we are resensitized by rupture, there's no understanding, there's no seeing things around us, there's no seeing the obvious, because we're so mm. in it, we're, we're swimming in right. the obvious, that, uh, and, and we don't know what we're in for. So we need these transversal events to burst through our bubbles for us to see ourselves for the first time and name ourselves differently. So for me, it's more like a gesture of leaning in, pushing in close and relating with the world in ways that disappoints my modern liberalist assumptions and conditioning. The, the ways that I've been coached into and I'm currently always being coached into thinking of the world as dead as a natural resource, socially distant. Suddenly the world breaks through and it's like, nah, 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 you don't own the future. You're not mm. all that is. And I have a say in how I world myself. So, you know, even with what that brother said about opportunity, even that can only be said in part. There's no full eloquence in this moment, in moments of surrender. Eloquence is a function of stability. When things go mm. asunder, when things fall apart, the most eloquent thing is a gasp, right? It's the cry and the lamentation of what do we do next? There are many parts of me that disagree with the notion of this time being an opportunity, right? Which might in some ears feed into the notion of some entrepreneurial spirit. Let's learn everything we can about this time. It almost feels like an invitation to build capacity But there's something about this time that is also about incapacitation, about right. the impossibility of going forward and about mm. staying in that moment. It's resolutely more than human. It's non-humanistic. It doesn't pretend to give us options or easily parsable solutions. It basically says, yeah, this is a place of your undoing. Sit with that. Mm. Yeah. I, I often think that to be a designer, which is what I am, is to be hopeful. And we'll get to your take on that maybe a little bit later. But I definitely experienced like just needing to accept what was, what is, and not necessarily seeing another solution than just being with it, which is for me is not my usual state. I run away to as finding solutions for everything. And so I'd love to start with this question that we, we ask everyone. And I know that your life has been a life of many transitions and maybe even revolutions in how you see yourself and how you engage. But I still would love to, to, to ask this question, which is what's something you learned or discovered in childhood or early in life 
that still drives you today, that's still with you today, that you haven't set aside? Mm. Well, let me go with, this is something difficult. And I will sit with why that is uh, later mm. on. But I find myself leaning towards family. The thing that's stuck is the gift of connections, of relationship. Mm. It haunts everything I do today. I'm not a master of it, but I am enraptured and stuck on it as a technology mm. for continuity. I cannot do without it. I s survive on solitude, and yet it's a queer solitude. It's a solitude that doesn't want to be alone. It's a solitude that's longing for comradeship, partnership, intimacy. Right? So there's this exacting tension that rules my waking and perhaps dreaming moments. It's, and it is the through line that you seek in your question. Family, mm. sisters, brothers, uncles, aunties, cousins, my children, my wife, my mother-in-law. It's that nothing really matters to me as much as my relationship with them. Mm. And this is, was the silent lesson of my upbringing. Mm. Do you have a specific memory that you can point to that this is when it started or this is when that door opened up for me? There are just too many. It's just... I describe it in my book, us, my, me and my sisters making my dad's hair into cornrows. It's those nightly moments when everything was fine with the world. And I was only burdened with philosophical questions about existence when things went awry. But it's mostly those nights when we cuddled and surrounded my dad when we played when we went out, even when he passed away, it was, it's just, there's, there's a beatitude or a series of sermons in those moments yeah. when I'm with others that I love and care about. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful answer. And so I know that you were born in Nigeria and then moved at a very young age to Germany. What was it like to start your life in this mode of transit, of moving around. What was, what was that like? I don't know any other life, brother. So I don't even know how to answer. It's all I've ever known. It's just transit, transit. We moved and moved. Of course, born into a diplomat family. That's all we knew to do. And when we're stable, it was in preparation for moving again, right? So much so mm -hmm. that I couldn't stay in my own country. I couldn't see myself settling in my own country or as people in my culture to marrying it within the culture like my mm. mother expected me to do i was looking out it was just a thing to do that i was going to move and travel probably become nomadic never stay still probably there's some theological denotations to this too because i've often mm. said to people that i don't want to arrive in heaven <laughs> it's like the end of all transits <laughs> mm. So maybe for you, heaven keeps changing location. Changing. That would be good. Yeah. Then it won't be heaven. Yeah. Then it would yeah. be ordinary, which is just extraordinary. Yeah. So you, uh, you ended up in India and you're, uh, you're very descriptive about falling in love and being swept off your feet. And so I, I'm wondering, I know many people who fall in love with India itself. India is, it's almost too much, right? It's almost too much for words. <laughs> people get this dreamy look. And I know people who just go there for months or years at a time. What's your relationship with, with India itself, the country? And, and was it tied to, to family? And what is it now? It's a love-hate relationship, actually, which is the best mm -hmm. kind of relationship, I think. It's not... Hack geographic. It's not, I refuse to lionize or deify or put it on a pedestal. Mm. I love the country, the culture, the colors, the scents, the sounds, the schizophrenic pantheons of gods and goddesses. I love mm. the uh, food. I love the people, the hospitality. Mm. But with every serving, 
of a piping hot dish of dosa and coconut chutney is a little bit of is a little bit of prejudicial treatment. I'm speaking about being a black man in mm. India. It's mm. not particularly easy walking down the road and seeing billboards advertising fair creams or fair and lovely mm. creams or something. Just you get a palpable sense that my skin color is low level, that I should probably apologize for looking this way. That is not particularly true of my relationships with people that I've met and that we have relationship with. But mm. th there's something that secretes out of every porous space, every membrane of space time here wow. is that you're black. What a mm. thing to be. Sometimes it feels like curiosity and sometimes it feels like a hierarchical displacement of my experience and of my person and my becomings. And at the same time, I'm quite wary about the nation state. I'm wary about any form of hyper-nationalism that mm. invests so much into feelings of patriotism that it loses itself and it loses its meandering creatureliness and then it becomes mm. this mechanistic devotion to supremacy and homogeny and monolithic ideals. It becomes fascist. So I'm quite wary about national anthems and flags and those sorts of things, which is another heavy sentiment that flows through. But I usually say to my people here, my tribe, that... India is resolutely schizophrenic. Even with those sentiments, those nationalistic sentiments, those other things that I usually feel quite uneasy about, there is there's something about it that resists capture. Like, mm. India will not be anyone's tool. India will yeah. not be categorized. India will not be put in a box. It will speak out in some way. Some god or goddess somewhere will break out of your conference hall <laughs> and mm. and upset the status quo. I, I like that. I like its unwieldiness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I have to ask myself if a billion people under any circumstances can yeah. be put in a box. <laughs> yes, there you go. I, I'm Israeli born and then I, I lived for about a decade in America in, in New York. And, and I still can't answer the question of what it's like and I, I, because I feel like everything is a clash. Everything is a force and a counterforce. Everything is true and its opposite is also true. And so while it's in the abstract, it's very easy to say, to make a lot of statements and be very critical. Also, some of the best examples of the exact opposite yes. I, I also see in the country, yes. you know, Part of me thinks that maybe even any number that more than two people is hard to categorize, maybe even one. But definitely when you're talking about a billion people, like how could you say anything about that? But that being said, I also recognize your experience from the little that I've spent with people from India. You know, I walked in a uh, with a friend down the street and she's, oh, it's really sunny. I'm going to get too dark. You know, my mother's going to yeah. kill me. Yeah. yeah. She's like, what? Um, it's so, it's... Uh, it's the culture, it's the, uh, you know, something, maybe something that needs to change. I, and I know you're not in that. We'll get into this activism, but like, this makes me want to be activistic and try to find a solution for how to engineer like a, a change of mind. And so you're not a fan, but right? you're not a fan of activism. You talk about post-activism. So, you know, what's wrong with just plain old activism? Nothing. I am not a fan of activism. I don't even think there's such a thing as activism in some stable, monolithic sense. I feel well, that there are activisms, but post-activism is not a way of saying, let's go beyond that. It's mm. not a dismissal of activism. It's not a superior form of activism. It's not after activism, like the name might indicate. It is post only in the sense of noticing, um, imagine you're in a room 
uh, and this happens all the time. It, it's not difficult for me to imagine at all. My wife comes into the room. Her name is EJ. EJ comes into the room and she's like, hmm, what's that smell? And I'm like, what smell? Come on, there's, I've been in here. She's like, can't you smell it? And then she goes to the kitchen and sure enough, there's something in the pot that I left overnight and did not put in the fridge or something like that. And it's rotten. Mm. She's been out and she's come back. And I, my nose, my, my sense of smell became desensitized to that putrid uh, s- smell. And I became one with it in a sense, right? Mm. And she has to come in. The external has to come in to disrupt that continuity and say, there's something here that you want to pay attention to. That's the only sense of, in sense of desensitization and sensitization and resensitization. That's the only sense in which I mean post-activism. It is, what do we do when agency is broken? Or what do we do when the way we respond to crisis becomes part of the crisis? What do we do yeah. when the very idea of design and our agency and our ability to solve problems is called out or called into question by a world mm. which will not be put that way? What do we do when healing or our attempts to fix a problem becomes the problem, right? Yeah. Medicine has yeah. a word for that, iatrogenic, right? Where the means to heal something becomes the very means by which we create even more greater suffering, right? So mm. what happens then? That's the question of post-activism, mm. that agency is never linear. If you think with post-humanisms, excuse me, post-structuralisms, feminist insights, indigenous realities, and all of these things that come together to create new speculative fabulations and new theoretical assemblages. If you think with these things, then you start to think, oh, agency has never been ours. Even when we say we are activists, we've never Mm -hmm. really talked about in depth how vast this agency is that we claim to be ours, right? When we say Mm -hmm. we are activists, there is a sense in which agency is a network and it enlists us into identitarian corpuscles and then uses us to particular ends so that it goes beyond our intentions, beyond even design, right? Mm. So that's the tragic and terrible undertaking of post-activism. It is to inquire into cracks, into openings and Mm. what we do with the world and how the world is done to us in those moments. That's one way that I'm finding my way into what you're saying is through systems thinking and thinking about how your attempts to to do good ultimately feed into a system that actually counts on what you're doing, that actually uses it, kind of co-opts it. And um, in my conversation with, so I, I spoke to David Peter Straw, who wrote the book, Systems Thinking for Social Change. And he goes into any number of big humanity scale problems like poverty and any number of things. And ultimately, when you analyze the system and the the interrelationship, he finds that many times the, the mindsets of the very people who are trying to fix and change the system are essential key parts of the system continuing to act exactly as it acts. Whereas, in fact, sometimes doing nothing would have been more effective because maybe Mm. you wouldn't have created the system that perpetuates a certain kind of struggle or a certain kind of conflict. So I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by by the feedback loops and just the ways that your action can yield unpredictable results or unintended consequences. Is there a way to accept all of that, not fully understand, but kind of accept that we're not individuals acting in a vacuum, that that we're in an interdependent thing and keep the intention to do good and find a way to act more wisely and with better consequences. Right, right. I mean, that's what we're doing all the time. It seems design is always anticipatory, right? You Mm -hmm. don't need a boardroom or a blueprint or pieces of paper to 
create design. It's design is going to the bathroom. Design is cooking, putting food together. Design is all of those things. It's how an right. eagle, right, or some birds of prey might swoop in for the kill and just capture mm. their prey and take them away. They never arrive at the same spot that their prey, which is also running, was. They are right. anticipating where it is yet to be and right. they swoop into that place. That's a highly complex and complicated anticipatory system. Right. Design is always anticipatory, always speculative. Now, the question that we're contending with is, who are the designers? Right. And mm. it's a question that's always up for grabs. One response that humanism might throw our way is that humans are the designers. The world around us is just the content of the last mm. part of the slave ship right? Natural resource. Mm -hmm. So we put it using our rationality and we condition our environment. We design things, we project into the future, we anticipate things and all of that. And in that story, in that, in that field, we are the designers. But like I said, everything that shows up only shows up in part. And so that story is held in tension with other stories that's invite us to notice that we are not the only ones that are enacting reality. So microbes, mm. bacteria, food, architecture, ecologies, archetypes, cybernetic frameworks, the air in its volatility, chemicals, colors, textures, all of these things yeah. are shaping the world. It is not just us. So that in a sense, humanistic notions of design are impossible. They are already conditioned by and available because of larger territorial forces at play. So there is, in a sense, we always have to meet a world that exceeds intention, exceeds mm. outcomes, exceeds systemic thinking. Because systemic thinking is also a creature of humanistic mm. notions of exclusivity, human agency, individuality, right? So we're mm. not, if we start to think relax the constraints of humanism, then we could notice that there are post-human forces that are already implicated when we speak about design, when we speak about mm. these algorithms. That's fascinating. One thing that comes to mind is even in, in system thinking, you know, any system thinking book or researcher or expert would tell you the boundaries of the system are arbitrary. <laughs> yeah. If you're trying to design or plan a system, it's never, no system exist in a vacuum. The boundaries are an arbitrary decision that you make on that piece of paper. I've taken a look this week at your wonderful course, We Will Dance with Mountains. First of all, I love, I love your titles. Uh, and then I also loved what I've seen in the, uh, essentially trying to teach post-activism as a practice. And by the way, I noticed you have Dr. Angel Acosta coming, who's a former guest on this show, but a fascinating mix of people and themes and in moods, I would say even. And I, so you, you have this quote up there and then I'll let you speak to it, but you wrote, recuperating our connections with a world that can no longer be seen as dormant, mute, and passive. So what is it about passivity? What change are we trying to enact in the mindsets or in the experiences of people? And why does that tie back into activism? In a sense, we are, like any good architect would tell you, I think, at least if I was an architect, I would say this many times, that people mm -hmm. are the functions of their contexts. It's not just people within context. It's that spaces are thick. They are momentous. Mm -hmm. They're agential. They drive people, they're instigatory. And so built spaces are motivational. You can build a house and the house would make you behave in certain ways as opposed to another house, which would make you behave differently. So we're not mm. just autonomous beings in the world. We are environmental qualities, right? Mm. So it's with that same idea that one would come to other built spaces, other spaces like modernity. 
and would notice mm -hmm. how this paradigm of the self instigates a blindness to the forces, you know, what I often call invisible forces that are at work, right? It premises itself on rationality and free will and um, Euclidean coordinates and the exclusivity of the self and the division between mm. man and animal, right? And the mm. postponement of the divine. Modernity is the fetish of the self, of the individual in some mm. sense, right? That's not all that can be said about that. And what that does for us is, is that it enacts a theology of forward moving bodies. It enacts a blindness to the things around us, to the things that are part of our becoming. Take it for an, uh, as an example, the ways that we enact care. One way we enact care is called cancel culture. Cancel mm. culture is in the sense, a form of caregiving. We are researching into boundaries. It's a way we are, without a research question set by a university professor, it's the way we are collectively, sometimes without any coherence, trying to understand what it means to be accountable to others. Mm. what it means mm. to show up for others. But its way of enacting care is premised on the individual. It's mm. premised on a linearity between selves, a directness, an interbeing. So there's something deeply Hegelian there. It's eye mm. to eye. It's me confronting you. And in that mode, it cuts out all the consultations that are possible all the other consultations, animistic, agential around us that make care a more robust and unwieldy thing than modernity can account for. So what council culture ends up doing in its reaching out for the other is to actually damn the other, is to actually resent the other, is to reduce a whole world of matterings and events and impossibilities and reduce it to the self and then create inadvertently this culture of blame and shame that doesn't mm. look like care, right? So mm. this is what we're talking about then. It, it's about what do we do with disability? What do we do with ruptures like the pandemic? Um, what does it afford us? What does mm. this gift, if you can call it that, or at least let's temporarily call it that, what does it allow us to notice that was not noticeable before? If we're being resensitized, what do we now notice? What is now obvious? What are our new questions? And where do we go with this? So mm -hmm. that is the invitation not to just teach others post-activism, which is the easiest thing to do. I formulated the theory. It's still ongoing. The, the mm -hmm. harder thing to do is to co-formulate it together, is to invite mm -hmm. researchers and say, Let's look into our environments. Let's heal. Let's look into our bodies and ask what it is doing or they are doing and see what wants to happen. You're listening to Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. There is this book that I'm working through, it's very dense, um, The Master and His Emissary by Ian uh, McGillchrist. It's about the two worldviews of the brain. That there's the right side has a, one specific worldview that he's describing and the left hemisphere has a, has a different worldview. And one thing that pops is that the right hemisphere tends to see, see things in a much more dynamic relational way. And the left hemisphere tends to see, see things in a much more logical and rigid way and verbal way. And so when you talk about bringing the world alive, that means to me, or at least like it connects for me with 
learn to see the dynamism all around you. And that mm-hmm. maybe requires you to use a different part of the brain than you usually use to discuss and dissect problems. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to go into the literature around the left brain, right brain thing, which is like psychology 101 for us. Um, I mean, there's so many things contestable about the idea that we think with one side or we desire and create with the other and things like that. What I would say is, I think we think with much more than our brains. We, we think with our guts too. And this is not even spiritual, not in a way that people think of our spirituality. It's not spiritual stuff. It is deeply biological, physiological, that the foods we eat, just consider this brother for a moment, that our guts are like third brains, right? Or second brains, if you will. And they, and the microbes in our guts actually enact our behavior, right? It's not us. We were composite beings all the way down. So there isn't a core of us, like a physiological soul that does the thinking and the acting. Instead, it's a ragtag group of migrants that live in our guts that do lots of things that like being sociable, for instance, and being friendly and being uh, moody. All of these things have to do with the microbes in our guts. And those, their health and their well-being has to do with the food we give them, right? And the food we give them is produced by political, social materialities and economies, right? Agricultural paradigms, right? So in a sense, thinking happens in the farm, Microbes are thinking, mountains are speaking. Do you see how these things are connected in a sense that upsets those unilinear algorithms that reduce pathology or reduce cognition to the brain? So people like Teresa Brennan and Anne Catherine Hills would speak about the transmissibility of emotions, right? That emotions are not inhuman, they're in the environment. Or Anne Catherine Hills would speak about the unthought that cognition is actually a network. It's non-conscious. It connects with towers and satellites more than consciousness. A lot of this stuff to me reverberates with the Buddhist concept of shunyata, right? Of, of emptiness. And I'm wondering if there is an element of that in your thinking of things being, I think emptiness is a not a great translation, but corelessness where things don't really have a, a an essential core. Things yeah. are aggregates. Yes. This corelessness you speak of, it's very attractive to me. I like, I don't know how it's met and held within the mm. traditions you are bringing and speaking mm. about, but yes, I'm really attracted to a corelessness. I'm, I, I like the open-endedness of things, mm. that the universe is a teenager instead of an old man or woman with a flowing beard or flowing mm. hair, that the universe is a teenager still awkward and figuring itself out and will never really arrive. It's, it's just yeah. somewhere in the middle. Yeah, that's a wonderful, a very hopeful way to look at the uh, mess that we're making is that we're yeah. in this teenage civilization or teenage society. So I think it's safe to say you're not a huge fan of hope. <laughs> um, Where did he get these ideas <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit. Good, but I like that. What's, Juicy, what's um, you, you talk about the end of hope. You try to problematize hope a little bit for us. And as someone who likes to think of himself as hopeful, I would love for you to unpack that for me a little bit. The, the irony is that my wife says I'm eternally optimistic. I'm the hopeful mm-hmm. person. Like, what if we, we can do, we can still do it. We can still, what if this happens? What if this happens? There is a sense in which I speak about hope as conspiratorially entangled with the political project of ongoing imperialism. And it comes down to this, the human, right? There isn't such a thing as hope or justice. This is derida and deconstruction. There are indeed floating ideals out there that we can just... Here's hope, here's justice, here's joy, here's love. It's that these effective, instigatory, sometimes messy and creaturely 
states of being, should I say, are tethered to political projects. They're always in the moment. So they live in the world in a certain way. They don't just float above it like giant aliens with huge wingspans. They are imbricated with plants and tar and skyscrapers and airplanes. They're part of how we are made in the world. They're part of how we ritualize continuity. Mm. So back to the human. I feel the human is the princely production of modernity. The human is not just the anthropomorphic figure that we're used to. The human is a territory of acting and feeling and doing, mm. right? Mm. It's a space-time economy, right? It, it mm. is the papacy and the church and the emerging industrialists basically shaping and tethering economies to clock time and shaping mm. calendars, right? It is how we lay down the first rail track. It is how we pushed and encroached on land and pushed into the forests, basically saying, mm. we can do it. If anybody right. can do it, we can do it. And so we pushed in and in. And in a sense, hope is how we are saying to ourselves right now, brother, that we can defeat the virus. If anybody can mm. do it, we can do it. It's how we're saying mm. to ourselves, we can defeat, notice the language, we can defeat climate change. If anybody mm. can do it, we can do it. In a sense, it is a political project. It is a way we are resituating ourselves, colonizing the next, reinforcing our presence as a mm. territorial colonizing species. And I feel that is deeply problematic, not just for the planet, mm. but even for our species. It's the articulation of permanence that in order to live, we have to stay here. We have to stay mm. in the familiar. And if there's anything to come our way, then we want to be accountable for it. We want to design our way out of it. We don't want it to hit mm. us in the face. We want to be in charge of what comes into our privacy, our boxes. So in that sense, hope is the engine that ran the slave ship. Hope is the cutting down of trees. Hope is the capturing of black bodies. Hope is the flattening of surfaces to make room for city halls and legislative buildings. Hope is how we created the world. And I wonder if there isn't a gift, if there isn't a calling in sitting with demise in sitting with grief, mm. in sitting with hopelessness. Not hopelessness as an absolute category unto itself, but as a glimpse of something impossible. Yeah. Yeah. The thing this, this brings to mind is again and again, I encounter stories of people going through a lot of pain or something really difficult and yeah. finding that they really can't talk to most people about these things. I mean, a classic example is like veterans coming back from a war and then nobody wants to talk to them about what they went through, but also terminal patients or people who have recovered from great disease or people who are disabled in some way. And, and you know, the, the hopeful people are not interested in, in, in having their worldview complicated or yeah. challenge or maybe enriched by different tones. So if this is what you're aiming at, then I completely vibe. At the same time, so I, I, I consider myself, so I learned this term really recently, tragic optimism. And this is how I would define myself, is that you try to see as much of the tragedy mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. but still wake up in the morning and think that it's worth living and yeah. think that, there's good things to experience and that, that, and that there are things that we could do, not necessarily things that we could do that will make these things go away, but things we can do that are worth doing. Yeah. Is that the kind of place where you want to dance with hope? Does that vibe with you? Let me place it as a different geometry of hoping and being mm -hmm. in hope with, right? Was it Lauren Berlant? of blessed memory that wrote about, yes, it is, cruel optimisms. Mm. Cruel optimisms. A cruel optimism is a relation of hope. 
in which what we hope for is actually more injurious to our health and survival than the things we're trying to escape from. So it's when hope mm. becomes a disservice, right? The things that we hope for. So but I hope I define that in a way that honors our work. It's a beautiful book that I read a long time ago. But this mm. cruel optimism might help us see what's happening. It's that sometimes we are enticed and trapped within images and mm. Images become steel enclosures. And the only way we can see ourselves doing other things is if something breaks down that image. The transatlantic slave trade did not collapse because good people stood up. It didn't buckle under its own weight because of the impressions of justice. Even the abolitionists in some um, iterations are described or reframed as capitalists who are seeking other means of contesting the exclusivity of their competition, mm. the slave traders. Mm. And we're looking for mm. other ways to reshape the economy. I'm trying to say that we're riding on so much more than just goodness or hope and things we learn to speak about in such categorical and final ways. And mm. one of the ways that People like Berlant and other beautiful feminist theorists especially have impacted my thinking is to help us see that those things that we name with such confidence, there are lots of things that they hide. There's a lot of dust under the carpet. So hope is doing much more than just driving us along into a brighter future. Maybe what we are calling for here and we don't know what we're calling for actually but what is being invited here is to sit with the trouble is to mm. not pathologize it don't so easily push it away build mm. a community around that fungus and by that fungus that fungal pathogen that has wrecked your corn might become a delicacy like huitlacoche in Mexico right? Mm. Literally a disease becomes a dish. Like, but you need to sit with it a while longer because if you cut out everything in the hopes of preserving the purity within the sanctity mm. of yourself, then you will end up losing yourself, might end mm. up losing yourself. That's, that's beautifully put. You, you talk about the violence of naming things or the, the limits of naming things. And, and again, this is, I think that this is the trickster you that likes to problematize things that we all take for granted. What is the challenge of naming things? Why is naming things sometimes undesirable or, or in, in what ways is it undesirable? In a very local way, naming is an agential cut. It's a, it's a cut we make, you know, um, it's a convenient marker. Like we're navigating a thick forest. And in order to pass through, we scratch the bark of the tree and say, I've been here before, right? So that we know how to get back there to the same place. That seems innocent mm. enough, finding our way, right? Mm. But there's something about finding one's way that is also simultaneously making one's way. And there's something about making one's way that is simultaneously unmaking one's way. In cutting in, we are cutting out. In making mm -hmm. certain things legible, we make others unintelligible, right? It's mm -hmm. just like your camera, your phone. You hold it to your face and you zoom in. In mm -hmm. zooming in, you gain clarity and focus, but you lose a panoramic that with you lose the ability to see things, the big picture, right? If you zoom out, you lose a little bit of that high definition and you have sold it and traded it for with, right? There, there's something yeah. about naming that blinds us. So there's this mm. proverb that is 
Indian that says, name the color, blind the eye. Mm. Name the color, blind the eye. In the moment we name something, and I'm not saying naming the world is how the world comes to be. That would re-centralize humans. And I don't think that mm. we're all that. I mean that there is a sense in which things are co-produced by our ritualistic activity of naming them. At least mm. for us, the namers, it orients us towards them in a particular way. And we yeah. lose sight of other possibilities. We lose sight of other things that the, that the thing might be sh- telling us, but we're not able to find or listen to because of the violence of the name. Yeah, the, the, this makes me think about, again, the Buddhist interpretation of if things are so interconnected and so interdependent, then any name is about ignoring those interdependencies. It's about yes, creating yeah. boundaries that necessarily leave the, the full picture out. Let me add to that, because the corollary of that is then, some people might ask, so how do we come to be with the unnameable and just be at one with, nah, 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 nah I don't do that shit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's not like, okay, how do we escape that trouble then? Right. Mm. I think the more humbling thing is to notice that we are that trouble. We are born in that trouble. We will die in that mm. trouble. Our dust would emerge mm. and co-emerge with that trouble. That we mm. are always imbricated with geometries of harm. Right. And there yeah. is no sidestepping that we will do violence to each other. We will do violence to things in our attempts to design our way out of trouble or even in yeah. our attempts to fix trouble. Yeah, it's, it, it's when you realize that everything you say ultimately is wrong, you have a choice to whether to shut up and never say anything again and then... <laughs> or say as much as you want to. It's, uh, it, this is not like... All right, or say, or say it with that understanding. And this is not like anything goes. There's a trope in social constructionism that would now submit that, okay, then anything goes, everything goes. No, this is not anything goes. Anything goes is a way of recentralizing humans, I think. Mm. It's not anything goes. It's that some things don't go, right. at least not for us. And, and we have to right. learn to live with that or not, right? right? So it's not some libidinous freedom that is suddenly ours because anything matters. No, there are moral architectures that are not necessarily foundational, but are resilient, Right. Mm. It is possible to mm. acknowledge that we think about the world in terms of good and evil, not because the world is primordially shaped into the vortices of good versus evil, but because culture and socio-materialities and microbes and airs mm. and atmospheres have somehow co-created these resilient pillars. And we often mm. congregate there. Yeah. Makes me think of the Indian uh, philosopher Chandra Kirti, who wrote something about he's listing different kind of everyday things like vases. And he's like, the Buddha did not say that these things didn't exist. The Buddha did not argue with the world about that the fact that the face doesn't exist. What, what he's saying is it doesn't exist separately. It doesn't exist as its own thing. It doesn't exist as, a, as an inherently essential thing. But that doesn't mean that there's no vase there. You're, mm-hmm. you're not going to go with your, you're not going to hit your head against the wall because you say there is no wall. So it's, it's a really interesting perspective. So um, I want to ask you about your experience homeschooling your kids. You said that that's one of the things that are most precious to you. With all of that strange perspective on the world, how does that affect interactions and and parenting and teaching? I just had an interview just before this Mm. (laughs) and and I spoke about parenting and I I said something that might have shocked the interviewer. And I I think I I said that children are a disability. And uh, let me elaborate that that by Mm. disability, it's in the most theoretically profound sense that uh, a disability is not a place of lack. It's a place of strange abundance where the world Mm. is swirling 
and murmuring and moaning and jumping and doing things that are not yet available, right? There's something about the gift of children that is disabling to adultism, that is disabling to righteous continuity. There's something about the child telling everyone in the village that the emperor's clothes, well, there are no, there are no clothes, it's stark right. naked, right? And everyone realizing then that, yeah, I think that's true, right? There, this, there is, this gift is a hard gift. It's a very mm. hard gift to hold. We created boxes to mm. entrap the gift. The brothers Kar- uh, Karamazov in Dostoevsky's novel took the Messiah in prison and they locked him there, right? Because they couldn't stand the Messiah. In the same sense, I feel uh, children are too much for our tastes. There, there's something mm. too much about them. The way children show up, at least within our settings, many of our settings is upsetting. Mm. Uh, and mm. that is the disabling. And how we reduce the burden of that is we put them in a the family way we school them and we need schooling in some respects. We need continuity. We need culture. We need acculturation in many respects. I'm not saying we do away with these things. I'm not a purist in that sense. But I am noticing that there are times of divergence when convergence becomes a problem. This is the issue of post-activism, right? There are times mm-hmm. when we are cracked open. And the most pernicious thing to do in that time is to fix the wound. Right. I think this is the time of sitting with the wound. Right. This is the time of convening classrooms around the wound. I think of children as cracks. Right. I don't even know how to be with children very well. And I'm even speaking about my own kids. I wax poetic about um, children all the time. But I didn't have a playful childhood. I mean, I loved my childhood, but I didn't. It may have something to do with the condition of being a nerd, but I didn't Mm. have that experience with children. So Mm. I'm learning and unlearning many things about myself. I'm meeting demons along the way, helpful demons, mocking demons, mocking angels and unhelpful angels at the same time. I'm meeting all of Mm. these vagabond creatures in the approach to my daughter, the approach to my son. But I feel this is my most vital task. I can't speak for anyone else, but I feel we are Mm. at such a stage in our, what do you want to call it, co-emergence as a species, when the vital thing to do may not be developing some alien technology to fix climate change, may not be creating artificial intelligence to replace human police officers. It may Mm. just be learning to be undone in the play mm. with our children. Wow, that's, uh, that's beautiful. Um, usually we ask uh, a closing question. Awesome. Uh, I feel you may have already answered it, but I'll, I'm going to give you a chance anyway, which is we talk about in, in his TED Talk, the philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. A mm. lecture being kind of a modern day equivalent that's dry and just provides a little bit of information. Whereas a sermon is the more of old religious way of doing things, which is an urgent plea to change your life. It's really trying to <laughs> grab yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you had a chance to give a short sermon to people listening, what would it be about? Interesting that... Uh, so, uh... The, the courses I do are usually on Sundays. And I often mm. think of myself as offering a sermon. It's this that I would say, in order to find our way, we must become lost. I think that's quite appropriate for everything we've been discussing. Um, mm. It feels ironic. It feels like a koan. It feels incomprehensible. But yes, I will raise my voice with Felix <laughs> Guattari and say that that this is the time to bring in incomprehensible things into the world. A madness of a poetic sort. Amen. Thank you very much, Pio. Thank you. Thank you, brother. 
All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, we run design sprints all over the world, um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or Uh, various organizations through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake.